Hi, I'm Susan Waters, and I'm here with Max Romy, um, filmmaker. We're happy to have you here. We're going to be doing a little Q&A on your film, Trailbound Alaska, and welcome. Happy to have you here today. Thanks so much. It's good to it's good to be here virtually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, virtually. That's true. Um, you know, I was really intrigued by the film. It's beautifully, it was beautifully done. Visually, it was it was really great. But I, I have a question as I was on the website that you have, and you mentioned that um, this project is um, six chapters. And I, could you hopefully, speak a little bit yeah, about loosely. that? like in classic Alaskan style, it really hasn't let me go linearly at all, uh, which is sometimes the best trips are the ones that really kind of set you off course. So it's been really cool. My hope was to be able to go basically from Kodiak all the way to Nome, uh, seeing how I can put that together. And this was really one of the parts in the middle, but one of the only parts I was able to pull off in a pandemic world with sort of all kinds of shifting things. So um, it's been a really cool experience to come back home to Alaska, which is where I am in Anchorage, Alaska, where I live, and to be able to come back home to Alaska and be able to see these trails, which I've been on and have really lived in since, you know, since I was much younger, um, but to be able to see them in a whole new light. And it, it really makes me really excited to kind of think on and how much more there is to really like experience out there. So you were you had mentioned to me earlier that you've spent a number of years traveling around the world filming and, and sketching. And um, so how long have you been making films? Boy, oh, yikes. Um, so I, was, I think like 10 years, maybe. I'm, I'm 27 now. Um, and when I grew up, uh, I really struggled with reading and writing. I, I was mentioning earlier, like I grew up with dyslexia. And so for me, reading and writing was really tough. And there's a lot, there's 20% of the population is on some spectrum of, you know, the dyslexia scale. And so I'm not alone by any means, but it really meant that a lot of avenues of visual creativity were much more open to me than, than anything else. And so I got really into watercolors, really into photography. Um, I wanted to share stories, but I really struggled to be able to share stories that, uh, that people could understand or see through the spelling errors. And, and filming is just like this combination of everything that's, that's not written. And I loved it. You've got like music, you've got movement and like, and sounds and poetry. And it's basically like all the good parts of storytelling minus the writing and reading. So it was like perfect for me. And so when I was 17, um, I started making my first films in like senior year in high school and just started making films that I wanted to see in, in Alaska. Um, they were nothing crazy, uh, but it really just sort of opened the door to me. And as a visual person, there's just, you can go in so many directions. So in college and then later on, um, it really, it really gave me an opportunity to travel around the world. And, and I was able to film really fast runners. I worked with a lot of uh, running brands, a lot of cross country um experience in my life helped me keep up with a lot of these people. And so my job was basically to go to a really fancy trail or a really fancy race or a really, you know, interesting journey with a cool person and then just film them throughout it and then uh, and then make a story of that. But it was kind of a dream. Uh, actually, like just before the pandemic, I, I decided to leave all that behind and come right back to Alaska and um, start filming the trails at home. Well, we're really happy you did. I was really fascinated um, by your process, your painting process when you're on the trail. I mean, it's one thing to be painting in a studio, but it's another thing to have your, you know, to do what you do out on the trail. And I, and I know, you know, what we see in the film is, is, is a, is a truncated version of that and very much spat up. But um, can you talk a little bit about that process of what you do with your watercolors when you're out on the trails? Yeah, that's it. I mean, from a, my grandmother is a really good watercolor artist. And from a really young age, I, I was always, you know, a sketchbook was put in my hand and, and they'd be like, stop raging around the house. Just go sit down and sketch and be quiet. And so like for me, watercolors has always kind of been a big part of my life. And actually I can kind of see like, I mean, this is, here's like you know i'll go through 
a sketchbook about each month, um, you know, on a normal time. It ebbs and flows. Sometimes I'll do like two a month and sometimes nothing. But like, you know, sketchbooks are, it's just, there's a lot of paper has been sort of through my life. And it's a really great way for me to um, kind of understand the world. When you're sketching, you're, it's not a photo. You're sitting and you are, you are capturing these little details of the world. And you can only you can only capture what you can see. So you spend so much more of your time looking than you do actually painting or sketching. And so um, it just felt like a really natural fit to this is this new trail for me. It's a very old trail. And I really wanted to kind of observe all these details and kind of feel it. And so sitting down and sketching seemed kind of natural. The issue is that sketching in Alaska is like a miserable experience 90% of the time. Uh, always worth it, even if it's just like a, you know, a book that has like a squashed mosquito in the page and just like a terrible little, <laughs> little line or something. Those, I can remember every single line that I put down. For me, that's, a, that's how I journal is I, I make a sketch and then whether it turns out well or not, when I look back at that, I can almost like feel the weather of what was happening at that moment. Um, but I really wanted to be able to share that experience of what it's like for me to kind of sketch on the trail with, um, with an audience and so that's where a lot of the animations and the graphics and kind of a lot of work to try to get that simple feeling of what it's like to sit and sort of watch the world move around you and make a sketch on a trail um and this was really one of the first times i'd really been able to to bring that to life on the screen i think that's a, a really good message for even those of us who aren't necessarily um artists and uh, you know we all have our our cell phones with us all the time and everybody's <laughs> snapping pictures and um which is great you've got all of these wonderful photos but we spend so much time with our eye to the lens that we don't really take a step back and really experience the moment it seems like what you do with with your process is is very much in the moment and very much being a part of of um the world that surrounds you while you're painting. I wish sometimes it could be less in the moment. There, there's definitely some of those moments where it's like, boy, why, why am I here? What am I doing? <laughs> but it's true. Yeah. It's like with a cell phone, you really can just, it's so easy to capture an image nowadays. A hundred years ago, if you wanted to capture anything, you would have to sketch. And it was just like a very, it was a very um, common thing is you would, you'd read and write and sketch. And that was just sort of part of, part of life. And, um, we don't need to sketch anymore. And I think we lose a lot by not doing that, but I'm not going to like, I, I've been doing it for quite a while, but I really struggle to get, to get pen to paper. So often I carry a sketchbook with me always, but the amount of times that I actually pull it out of my backpack are, are very few and very far between because it's really scary. You have a blank sheet of paper. Like, I mean, even, yeah, like, well, uh, there's muskox on that sheet of paper, but like, you know, you have like a mostly, a mostly blank sheet of paper. And then like, this could be anything. It could be the best painting of your life. It could be the worst painting of your life. And sort of that fear of like starting holds me back so much. And so actually kind of building up the courage and the, the momentum to actually start a painting is super tough. And I think, um, something I need to tell myself a lot is just to just to make it happen because there's always another sheet of paper there's always another beautiful view and um, the benefits of making a sketch or just sitting down just for a moment are so much further uh, reaching than than just the painting itself and and it's something that no picture could do yeah well I I, I read somewhere um, is, is and now is this true? when you're in really extreme weather, you have to mix moonshine or some kind of alcohol with <laughs> to keep things from freezing. Yeah, no, it's like this, so this is, uh, let me see. see. <laughs> this is like, I'm just grabbing from my desk here. Um, like my, my go-to is like a little palette like this. Um, it's just little art toolkit palette. Um, th these are actually made in Port Townsend, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's like a local watercolor company there, but like just a, a pretty basic palette. And then I often, depending on the weather, will have to use either a quarter or half or sometimes even 100% uh, gin or moonshine, anything that's about above 40 proof or 40%, um, which I guess would be 80 proof, because the you're putting the thin line of water on a on a very thin sheet of paper. And then sometimes at least in, in Nome, it's when I was sketching toward there, you know, it'd be negative 40. 
And even at negative 40, gin freezes, I found out. But you have to do something that keeps the liquid liquid long enough to get it onto the brush and onto the paper. Um, it makes for some cool effects. It doesn't make for very easy sketching, but it's the process of you're really kind of diving into the elements and you're really kind of, um, I mean, the trail is affecting you in that way. You're, you're really becoming so much more connected, even though sometimes you wish you were much less connected. And I, I think it was a really interesting experience and something I hope to continue with, with more films because um, I feel like I just learned so much by slowing down just a little bit to paint. Well, let's talk about the film a little bit and, and what you did there. Were there any, I mean, obviously in the film, we see some of the challenges that, that you all faced in, in sort of finding the trail that had been obscured, but were there any unexpected challenges that came up as you were making this film? That's a good question. So we went from sewer to Anchorage and I think most of the challenges that could be mitigated were. We had a really great crew that really helped out a lot with that. Um, my wife was a huge help, a big part of it. We had a really great producer named Lila who really just like organized everything. But um, I think I think a bunch of it was just the these tr they're very long trails, and when you when you don't have a trail there, it's just it was absolutely brutal to kind of feel that that like trying to just push your way through wilderness. I, I, I found that to be really demoralizing um, when we had to turn back. So often in these films, you kind of see people pushing and pushing and like they go through no matter what. And and it's all about like, they pushed it right past the boundary. Um, and, and it often works out in the films because they made a film about it, but you never hear about the ones where like it went horribly wrong and, um, and mentally what that's like. And um, I found it really discouraging to have to head back, but after a lot of encouragement, it was so awesome to be back on the trail. So I found I found it really tough to stop, but also um, just these trails are out there, and it's just like sketching. It's like if you don't get the shot at first, like that's okay. There's there's so much beyond the picture, and so it was really great to um, to have those obstacles to make you really appreciate where you're at, because I think so often it's easy to take these trails for granted. And um, and they are really amazing places, uh, whether you're in Alaska or in the Pacific Northwest, the, the trails that are kind of below our feet really are uh, this like language and this history that's that's been there and so often they become invisible. Yeah, I really like the way you equated the trails and the process on the tra trails to, to storytelling. Um, and, and I think that it also kind of, for me, it kind of connected back to your story of, of being a person who's um, working with dyslexia and, and how that really colors your perspective of how you approach, well, for you, your art, filmmaking, painting, all of that. I think it really, um, it, it gives a different kind of a flavor for, um, for how you tell stories, um, and and it's, and I appreciate that. It, it's an interesting, you know, it's very visual, obviously, and um, and very um, very moving too. And yeah. I, I was gonna I was gonna ask you about uh, the Iditarod Trail, the historic trail, in particular, uh, because you do run into lots of different places on the trail that need help or need to be rebuilt. Is there progress being made in, in sort of connecting those dots again? There was some really amazing process progress. Uh, they, they're calling a lot of it the long trail. That's sort of what they're they're pushing for. We have the, the Pacific Crest Trail in you know Washington to California. We have the Appalachian Trail that goes all along the East Coast. Um, there's some huge ones in Canada, uh, but there's no real Alaskan long trail um, I guess the Iditarod is is a very long trail, but nothing anybody realistically hikes, especially in the summer. And so there is a huge push to make the long trail happen. Um, there's there's a whole website. They had some funding that I think was vetoed by the current governor. So people are using it as a political football right now, but it, it is moving forward. And once these are connected, there is going to be something like the PCT that nobody's ever seen before. Alaska is 
colossal in a way that's really hard to understand, especially when a lot of it is just you you drive these roads and you just see these amazing landscapes go on and on. But they could like Alaska has mountain scapes that could eat the Alps and you'd never notice. It's a gigantic place. And um, and a long trail is something that could really help people experience that. So hopefully uh as these trails do get right now, they're being connected mile by mile. The Southern track is I believe the first bit, which is what we did, it's about 150 miles. Um, a good chunk of work has been done on that. And then hopefully once that's kind of set, people really realize the value and the importance of these trail systems, um, both economically and just from a, from a cultural, from a um, you know community, from a, a, even a public health mindset. Everybody realizes, especially after being locked up in a pandemic, outside and, and nature is really important and um and it might seem something so simple just like a strip of dirt on the ground but uh strips of dirt can have pretty huge impacts well and i think you play a part in that and telling these stories and getting getting that information out on film and it helps spread the word i think gets people um you know interested and engaged in 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 what's happening with the trails there so uh, that's that's pretty exciting yeah, um, well, and I think like, I think that's something too that I'm really realizing. You were talking about obstacles earlier. Everybody has obstacles in their own life, but those obstacles are what make that journey to where you are interesting. Even with trails, you know, a, a trail with no obstacles is just a straight, boring line. If if uh, if there were no obstacles in Alaska, it'd just be point A to point B. But these mountains, these lakes, these valleys. Um, the things that we go around are what make the trail interesting. And I think the same can be said for our own lives. And for me, the obstacles of dyslexia and filming and watercolor and the way I overcame those led to a really interesting visual way to share those. But that's just one journey and and the fact that I'm able to bring that up at home. And so I really hope that some people can see this and appreciate the obstacles in their life and how they could tell those stories for their own home, whether it's you know, specifically about trails or perhaps, you know, protecting nature in their own community. Um, everybody comes to life with these really interesting obstacles, but I think those obstacles are going to lead to some really amazing solutions, uh, especially locally. Boy, I hope so too. So what do you have going now? Anything new? Projects? Oh my gosh, too much new. Uh, <laughs> it's It's been a really wild year for a lot of people, but for for moving forward, it's been a really amazing um, feeling to feel so supported in in combining this this journey of painting and um, and filmmaking. I've been told by a lot of people just to stick with the filmmaking um, because it's safe and it's it's known. And putting a little bit of your heart, a little bit of your own artwork into this is a really scary thing. Um, and that's what the last two years for me have been is just kind of putting yourself out on this like ledge for people to, you know, for, to fail really. Um, and so this is just a really small film about a, a small section of a small trail in a huge state. But my hope is to be able to do a lot more um, outside with watercolors. So this winter, my plan is to stick actually pretty close to home. I'm working uh, locally to do a series of at least six paintings in and like within an hour of Anchorage. So I'm not going to leave more than an hour of Anchorage to do these paintings. Um, and instead of doing something where I fly a super far distance to do something really quick in one spot, I'm going to travel only within an hour of Anchorage, stay somewhere for the whole day and make one giant painting, um, which I'm really excited for to kind of see how the world moves. Um, and so it's still pretty new for me. I'm still pretty nervous about how it's all gonna look, but I'm really excited for the experience of just kind of slowing down and seeing the amazing things that are like right in my backyard because uh, so often I think the most beautiful things in life are just too close to us to focus on. It's almost mm -hmm. like they're like right here. So it's still kind of blurry. And, and sometimes you just need to kind of take a little bit of a step back to realize what an amazing place that, that we often live in. So I'm excited to do that locally in Anchorage um this winter and then in the summer i work a lot with marine debris but all of it i think will be tied together with watercolor and uh and really leaning into those obstacles to create a new solution that's that's perfect for me i suppose 
Well, that's exciting to hear because I think you do amazing work with your watercolors. So looking forward to, to uh, having you share with the world some of the projects that you're working on this winter. Um, as we begin to wrap up our conversation here, I, I guess I'd like to circle back around to the film and just ask you um, what you would like to hope that an audience would um, learn or take away from your film. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Boy, like every filmmaker's dream, I'm sure there's just like a, you know, bullet list of just like, I hope they take away these things. Um, I guess like the first is that there is deep connection between these outdoor places and, and how we live our lives. I think it can sometimes feel so remote or so like detached, these outdoor places. It's almost like, right, you live your life and then you go to this other place as if it's as if it's not connected at all. But um we live in a world that that needs these and it feels like we're increasingly becoming detached from them you know I, as i talk to you virtually from zoom I, I i love what technology is able to do but for the technological advancements i think it's really important that we also get back to a lot of the basics and and uh if somebody watches this i hope i hope that they they maybe volunteer, maybe they, you know, check up what's going on locally and, and work to protect those places that are there for them. Um, nature is something that doesn't just happen naturally, you know, even though the words are there. It's something you really have to fight for and protect. What we're doing here with the Alaska Long Trail, um, you know, with uh, with with making things more accessible, more um you know, I mean, just even possible. So you don't have to bushwhack for a day and a half to to make it about a mile. But um, but this is happening all the time on all sorts of scales, and and it, nature nature needs us, and we need nature. And to to have access to it is not guaranteed. So I'm just so grateful for everybody who's come before and has really made this possible. And I'm so excited to be part of them moving forward to uh, to volunteer and to um, to fight to make to make those opportunities accessible and possible for people moving forward. Well, we're so happy that you um, share your films with us with the Friday Harbor Film Festival and uh, you're like kind of part of the family. I know you've been here in previous years, so can't can't wait to see what your next steps are and, and hope that you'll have something to uh, come back to us with next year, maybe hopefully face to face. Yeah, right. That's that's the dream. Well, part of what's so wonderful about being in Friday Harbor and just like, you know, the the San Juan Islands in general. I went to school in Bellingham at Western and I mean the the trails and the access to the outdoors that we have there are just, you know, they're they're incredible. It's wonderful to be with these people, but like also just like that's a community steeped in in these places. And um I think it's a great example of of uh of kind of that amazing connection that could and, and hopefully will be built a lot over. Um, I know that that I'm super lucky to have those opportunities and I'm sure there's organizations that work to help bring other people there, but we protect places we know. And um, and I just hope more people get the opportunity to know places, whether they're the San Juans or or Alaska or these trails. And uh, and I'm I'm just like, the more I the more I see, the more I'm so grateful for for what I've been able to experience in my 27 years and, and, uh, and hope, hope to be able to share some of that. Well, thank you so much. We, we appreciate your, your work and um, really a pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, can't wait to talk to you again soon and, and, and see the next thing you're going to do. So thanks a lot, Max. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Have an awesome night. You too.